So this workshop is going to be on finding a subject for your film. Um, first, a disclaimer. Um, you might find some of what I have to say useful, or you might find that it doesn't fit the specific circumstances of your work. Um, I will say from the beginning that my obsessions may be different from your obsessions. We're talking about an art form, and uh, there's no one prescribed checklist here, but I hope that you can parse some tools to use in your own work, whether you're submitting to the Peonia Film Festival in May of this year, <clears throat> or you're working on a longer term project. Um, the reason I chose this topic to lead a workshop on is because I don't hear all that often about how filmmakers uh, find subjects that they can work within. Um, and I've also personally gone through pains to find subjects um, for my films outside of this sort of tangle of media and develop them with originality in mind. Um, <clears throat> so, what I, so I hope what I have to say will be useful for you in finding your bearings and avoiding some of the pitfalls that I've experienced. Um, so I've learned mostly from doing. Um, <clears throat> doing can take various forms depending on the scope of what I'm working on. Um, it can mean going out with a camera and improvisationally capturing a slice of reality, taking it back to the editing room and putting it together with some semblance of underlying cohesion. Um, that's one method, and it can be helpful in exploring a subject. Um, but though I'm inclined to take my camera out pretty much the moment um, I see something even remotely interesting, um, more and more often for me, I try to stay away from this impulse. Um, I'll read books, articles, listen to podcasts, have conversations, drive to locations. Um, try to generally immerse myself as much as possible. And primarily though, I'll sit in a room with no distractions and wait. Um, <clears throat> as David Lynch puts it, if you wanna catch little fish, you can stay in the shallow water. But if you wanna catch the big fish, you've got, to you've got to go deeper. Down deep, the fish are more powerful and more pure. They're huge and abstract and they're very beautiful. So in terms of what I feel I can distill from my own experience into something of a lesson here, we're gonna look at this method, which for me means separating wheat from chaff over a significant period of time so that I might actually have something that, I, that feels concrete um, that I can understand and take and shape into a story. Um, this isn't exclusive to documentary or fiction. I'm actually attracted to both documentary and fiction, filmmaking for the same reason. Um, within both formats, with some digging and direction, you can get to the center of the truth. Um, I think it's hard to separate personal truth from what's hot politically, socially, culturally. So I wanna to touch on how to find your own truth in your work, whatever the genre, um, and how this can provide clarity for direction and overall cohesion of your story. Um, so this is also called the theme. I, I have a problem with defining these concepts because I think you should only get so analytical with art, but for clarity's sake, when we're talking about this stuff, I think it's important to throw some definitions up here. Um, so if the subject is the broader abstract uh, topic that you're exploring, be it love, power, truth, uh, nature, death, or forgiveness, the theme is the central idea that you found that is universal and provides insight into life and the human condition. Um, so it's a truth statement. <clears throat> um, an example, a, a ghost story is out on Netflix if you haven't seen it. Um, I don't think I'm gonna to give too much away here by saying that the subject is on death and the theme which is subjective to both the writer and the viewer because truth is almost always subjective. I interpret it as humans create meaning around life when life is not inherently meaningful. Um, and you'll note that this is an explicit argument for the way we interpret life rather than 
a generalized statement that isn't really going to say that that, that isn't really saying anything. Um, if the theme were instead death, um, it wouldn't have the same weight to it because death isn't an argument, it's a subject. Um, typically the more explicit and pointed the theme, the more likely you are to say something profound and articulate that an audience will connect with. Um, another way to think about this is in order to say something that, sorry, in, order, in order to say, <clears throat> I'm gonna restart that. Another way to think about this is in order to say that something is true, something else needs to be false. Um, <clears throat> so a compelling story, the battle between what is true and what is false. When a story takes two competing ideas and gives them equal footing, um, <clears throat> it creates a tension that is at once entertaining because we wanna know if our hero will prevail in the end. Um, and it can make for a compelling argument for the truth that does prevail because often it will shatter and reform into something stronger as a result of the confrontation. Um, it's the same thing that happens when you get in a really bad fight with your significant other. Um, you can either think about that fight from your own perspective, your significant other perspective, or the new perspective that you or your significant other have adopted as a result of the fight, uh, for better or worse. Um, the new perspective that is created is of course still subjective to that couple, but it's closer to an objective truth because it accounts for more than one subjective reading of reality. Um, so <clears throat> some more examples, let's look at um, Batman Begins. Um, we actually see multiple competing ideas in this film along the trajectory of young Bruce Wayne um, as he becomes Batman. At each stage, we see competing ideas presented as characters. Um, so we begin with a violent and grief-stricken Bruce Wayne who is out for revenge <clears throat> and he competes with justice-seeking Rachel Dawes to create near-pacifist Bruce Wayne who then competes with violent anarchist Raz al Ghul um, to create justice-seeking a more ethical justice seeking Batman. Um, so in each case, there are competing truths that lead to the ultimate truth or central theme of the film. Um, so you as the filmmaker can start from a place where you've already critically examined that ultimate truth and then work backwards to try to understand how you got there and build your forces of opposition to eventually settle on that truth. Or you can start with either the protagonist or antagonist point of view and critically examine the other sides to build your ultimate truth. Um, however you go about it, you will need to acknowledge the other sides if you wanna create a compelling argument for the truth that you ultimately settle on. Um, I wanna show a clip <clears throat> from that movie now just to give you an idea of how the theme percolates down um, from the macro elements, the theme, to the micro elements of the film. I understand why Judge Fagan insisted on making the hearing public. Falcone paid him off to get chill out in the open. My ass should be thanking them. You don't mean that. What if I do, Rachel? My parents deserve justice. You're not talking about justice, you're talking about revenge. Sometimes they're the same. No, they're never the same, Bruce. Justice is about harmony, revenge is about you making yourself feel better. Which is why we have an impartial system. That's why your system is broken. <laughs> you care about justice? We'll be on your own pay, Bruce. This city is rotting. They talk about the depression as if it's history, and it's not. Things are worse than ever down here. Balcony floods our streets with crime and drugs, preying on the desperate, creating new Joe Chills every day. No, Balcony may not have killed your parents, Bruce. But he's destroying everything that they stood for. You want to thank him for that? Here you go. We all know where to find him. 
As long as he keeps the bad people rich and the good people scared, no one will touch him. The good people like your parents will stand against injustice. They're gone. What chance does Gotham have when the good people do nothing? I'm not one of your good people, Rachel. What do you mean? All these years I wanted to kill him. Now I can't. Okay, so um, you can use the dynamics that you build between competing truths, um, in this case, <clears throat> the revenge seeking Bruce Wayne and the justice seeking Rachel Dawes coming to head. Um, you can use these um, competing truths to inform not only the way that you structure your film, but also to shine light on all of the decisions you make in steering your film in the right direction throughout the process. So that includes dialogue and character action, be it a fiction or a nonfiction. <clears throat> so to recap, themes are statements about, <clears throat> themes are statements of truth about a broader, often abstract subject. Um, establishing competing truths can be useful because they must independently acknowledge the other side. Um, create compelling arguments for why their truth is the right one and point to your ultimate theme. Understanding the competing truths and ultimate truth will give you clarity in how to structure and steer your film on the macro and micro levels. <clears throat> um, okay, I already touched on it, but I wanna dive a little deeper into why finding a credible ultimate truth takes a lot of digging into what you personally believe um, <clears throat> and into your opposite. Into, into the opposition of what you believe, um, not only for credibility sake, but also to make a film that's gonna stand out and resonate with people. <clears throat> so what does it look like when a film doesn't present two competing ideas? Um, I wanna show you the opening sequence from the 1935 documentary, Triumph of the Will by filmmaker Lenny Rianstaff. And I'll explain why afterwards. I should also give you a warning that you might find this content a little bit disturbing.
<clears throat> okay, so you can spend a long time thinking about the word documentary. Um, it comes from document. What is a document? Something that asserts a truth about a, a, a truth through facts and data. But who is asserting the truth and to achieve what end? Um, the storyteller gets to decide how they present data, its credibility or lack thereof, and how that data might impact other people. Um, so in this case, Adolf's plane moves through the clouds from his, his perspective, equating him to this sort of deity. Um, the, his people love and hold him in the highest regard. <clears throat> um, and the score swells beautifully to enforce both of these ideas. So I'm trying to drive home the point that films tend to make statements about how reality is organized. And sometimes that means delusionally propagating a fascist dictator. So you wanna take care to not do that. Um, <laughs> what makes this film propaganda is not that it's ger a German perspective during the thirties, it's that this particular populist, sorry, it's that it is only this particular populist German perspective during the 30s um, and has been painstakingly crafted by its authoritarian government. Um, <clears throat> Takia Watiti's 2019 film Jojo Rabbit, in stark contrast, makes its own truth statements. Um, I'm going to show the beginning sequence to that movie now. Spoiler alert for that. You're Joe Betzler, 10 years older. Today, you join the ranks of the Unibok in a very special training weekend. Going to be intense. But today, you become a man. I swear to devote all of my energies and my strength to the savior of our country, Adolf Hitler. I am willing and ready to give up my life for him. So help me, Lord. Yes, that's right. Now, Jojo Betzler, what is your mind? Snake mind. And Jojo Betzler. What is your body? North body. Jojo Betzler, what is your courage? Panther courage. Jojo Betzler, what is your soul? A German soul. Yeah, man, you're ready. Adolf? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I can do this. Ross? Of course you can. Sure, you're a little bit scrawny and a bit unpopular, and you can't tie your shoelaces even though you're ten years old. But you're still the bestest, most loyal little Nazi I've ever Okay, so that was the setup for the journey that Jojo Rabbit's, Jojo's character goes on in Jojo Rabbit. Um, the film takes the propaganda that you saw in Triumph of the Will and subverts it through absurdity and marriage of Adolf Hitler, Jojo's imaginary mentor, with the reality of the Holocaust. Um, by doing so, it makes a strong universal statement of truth that says, kids should not always trust their mentors. Um, I'm touching on such a serious topic because I wanna juxtapose the stark difference between truth statements in terms of their validity and in terms of 
the other truth statements that filmmakers can either choose to acknowledge or ignore entirely. Um, but beyond the social cultural reasons to create and understand your competing truths as a filmmaker, it's also worth noting that conflict can be incredibly engaging from an entertainment point of view. Um, and I think Jojo Rabbit is a great example of that. <clears throat> so what? Um, well, now that we understand what's at stake here, I wanna make this conversation a little more practical and talk about how to frame a film around a subject in a credible way. Um, triumph of the will, though delusionally subjective, presents itself objectively without a competing truth claim. Um, in contrast, a great way of presenting information in a documentary, especially one that is developed within a limited time frame is to give the audience a subjective human as the protagonist with a specific history who is on a mission. Um, that mission can be to talk to somebody, uh, Michael Moore's Roger and me, um, learn about an issue, any Vice episode, um, or to experiment with a ridiculous idea, <clears throat> supersize me. Um, because they don't claim to be anything more than one point of view, um, confronting other points of views. They can be human, wrong at certain points, and still be truthful. Many of these types of documentaries use cinema verite or fly on the wall filmmaking techniques um, <clears throat> where a cameraman captures reality sort of as it's happening um, because it does feel like more of an exploration than a fixed assertion. Um, again, just to be annoying, this doesn't mean that their points of views are true, but especially if you're going into a subject with fresh eyes, this is one way to, uh, you can make your argument stand up <clears throat> by acknowledging your own subjectivity um, and humanness. Um, so I'm trying to point out the idea that subjectivity can be embraced and can actually strengthen your truth statement because you're not making a claim that extends further than the specific characters you're working with. Um, it begins with a character who believes one thing to be true, confronts another thing, and that could be true, and hopefully settles on a higher resolution truth. Um, so when I'm on the prowl for a subject that I'm hoping to find a film within, I try to find a truth that, I've, that I'm already seeped in to one degree or another, um, or a subject that I'm super passionate about um, and could see myself continuing to be passionate about for the entirety of the time that I'm working on it. Um, and this is really important actually because the filmmaking process can be super lengthy and not always super rewarding um, throughout the process. Um, so whether I studied the particular subject extensively or have just come across it, I'm always trying to ask myself, um, <clears throat> what my access is to the subject, because this will inform the type of perspective that I end up developing. So a quick case study here. Um, the short fiction that I'm currently working on is about political polarization um, reaching a boiling point. Um, it's timely and I'm interested in the subject material generally but I'm not a political scientist and I don't really know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> um, the way that I'm getting around this, and we'll see if I can pull it off, is by centering it in a protagonist who is struggling to find his way through this mess also. Um, at the beginning of the process though, I didn't, uh, or I found myself worrying about how to make the piece entirely indicative of everything that is happening in contemporary politics. Um, oh no, the Capitol Hill riots just happened. I guess I'll need to include that in a scene. Um, if you try to include everything going on socioculturally in your film, fiction or documentary, uh, A, it, be, it can become pretty diluted in general, which for you as the filmmaker can make it difficult to direct and personally understand and B, um, it makes it challenging to stand out from the crowd and say something specific and unique about the subject. So I think, especially on a short time frame, leaning into your idiosyncratic and unique point of view to find a subject that you've already accumulated knowledge on 
can be helpful in generating a strong statement of truth. Um, as long as that statement of truth is challenged. Um, for the short that I'm working on, for instance, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to personally reach into an area of politics that I don't fully understand. So my statement of truth isn't oriented that direction. Um, the film instead asserts that finding an identity within the surplus of opinions that exist is complex um, and we should learn how to take the power away from that gut feeling that we all experience within our comfortable social bubbles. Um, even if you disagree with that particular statement, um, it's become specific enough for me that I can use it to help direct the elements of the film that I haven't quite figured out yet. Um, and I can always lean back into this truth that I've mined over the period of time that I've spent listening to podcasts, talking to people, critically thinking about it to ground myself in the ideas that are most essential uh, to this film. <clears throat> there's, so there's still a way to make an interesting movie about what's currently happening um, with the clock ticking. Um, usually though, it works best to point your camera at a subject you've already critically engaged with, um, something you talk about with your friends um, or you think about often. Um, because you'll be more apt to have a point of view that you can funnel reality into, and you can get specific about it when it comes to building a structure um, that an audience will connect with. It doesn't mean you need to know everything about the subject or the events that could happen. Uh, it's not possible, um, but it is helpful to have an anchor when you're ordering the chaos of reality into video. Um, so exploring something that's been ailing you personally or ailing your community, either nationally or locally is valid um, and a way to create a statement of truth. Uh, I'll bring this back to the short film that I'm writing again and say that it started with a particularly frustrated journal entry about our current political divide. It was a means of literally getting out what was in my head onto paper. And I don't know that, uh, and I didn't, I didn't know what that I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, and I didn't like that I didn't know what I was talking about. So I started to pay more attention to those thoughts and that snowballed into research, ideas rising to the surface. And not too long after that, I was writing an outline and then a draft. So even if you ignored everything I just said and went out and shot something, um, you will have similar questions. They'll probably just occur in the editing room. Um, what am I trying to say? What's the conflict? What is the truth here? Um, I spent an annoying amount of time today talking about truth or theme because I think when you first dive into a subject, you will come up against the question of what you're really trying to say um, within it. And I often end up completely reconfiguring what that subject is in order to better explore what I want to explore based on the theme. <clears throat> so getting to this core should help you wade through the rest. Um, to sum and wrap up, find your theme, find your subject. Truth in the way it is framed is important from both sociocultural and entertainment points of view. Uh, your job as a storyteller is to do so responsibly by acknowledging competing truths of your subject and finding an ultimate truth that has credibly weighed the other truths. Uh, listen carefully to yourself and explore <clears throat> what you're most passionate about to its deepest level. So some parting questions. Um, what subjects have, you, have been on your mind a lot lately? Um, what's something that has frustrated or excited you about the way reality is organized. Um, how can you use this to create a statement of truth that can be challenged in your film? Um, <clears throat> and again, if you're still asking, so what? I think that's, it's fine and, and that's all fine and well. Um, I'm all about subjectivity. So I think take what works for you um, from what I, uh, just went over and you can throw the rest out. Um, and that is all I have. So 
we can open up to questions at this point. So if you have a question, go ahead and unmute um, and then um, we can take, and then Brennan can take your questions. Um, if you'd prefer to enter your question in the Q&A, uh, we can also do that. Uh, Brendan, I have a question. Um, I think you kind of touched on a little bit, um, but how often do you switch do you, after filming? Do you find yourself switching subjects or, or truths or themes, or do you pretty much find yourself, uh, you know, using the same thing from the start? Um, <clears throat> it, it, it definitely varies. Um, usually, like, I'll, I'll jump into a subject <clears throat> because I'm just kind of attracted to it for whatever reason. Um, and then I'll, and then I'll start to like, think more critically about like, okay, I like this subject, but what, what is it within the subject that I'm really trying to say? And that's when I think the subject can change because when you figure out what you want to say, it, you can, you might actually find out that, well, this subject helps me achieve that better than this subject does. Um, so, so that's usually what I try to lead with, um, the the film that I, I kind of was talking about um, in there a little bit, uh, the, the subject was always sort of the same in terms of political polarization, <clears throat> but the characters changed a lot. Um, and the specific dynamics of the characters changed a lot um, as I sort of figured out, okay, this is the subject, but this truth is that I'm trying to allude to is, is different this way. Um, and so I, I did a lot of experimenting and I, I don't know if there's really one way to, 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 to jump into it. I think you could start with the subject or you could start with the theme and play with it and see what works. Um, that's what I've kind of always done. And then uh, maybe have you ever had like a tr um, an involve fiction maybe, maybe it's not exactly the story maybe like jojo uh, rabbit i mean mm -hmm. i assume that dialogue probably didn't actually exist with that little kid maybe it did um do you i mean how do you i mean it may not be exactly the truth maybe i mean truth is not maybe what you're intending there i mean um is it okay to involve a little bit of fiction in your story <clears throat> yeah, I think um, I think that's totally. I, I think you can you can certainly stray from um, <clears throat> from what's true to to allow those to, to allow fiction into your story. Um, I think you can still say something that's true and and center it in a world that's totally fantastical. Um, uh, Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. Um, those have statements of truth within them, but um, the subject is entirely, you know, it's, it's, it can be absurd. It could be something, you know, um, <clears throat> so does that answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? This is, uh, if no one else is going to chime in, um, what kind of tools do you use to kind of do, I mean, just word, word processing or do you have certain tools or? Oh, just in, in terms of actual writing or? Mm -hmm. um, like formulating so your, your ideas, go ahead. Oh, formulating my ideas. Um, I do different things. I think it'll, that'll sort of vary depending on the individual, but you know, I, I'll listen to podcasts and, and I'll be going for walks and I'll stop and I'll just write down ideas on my phone. And then I'll go back in and look at those ideas <clears throat> and explore them a little bit later um, in more depth. That's something I'll do. I'll also journal entries. Um, 
or talking with other filmmakers is, is a great way to, because sometimes you have these ideas in your mind and you don't realize that like <clears throat> they're entertaining or they're interesting. Um, but the more you talk to other people, um, uh, the more you can sort of get those ideas out and people can sort of validate them for you. Um, so you might already have a great idea and it, it's just kind of, you know, in your subconscious. Yeah, I mean, I'm just so new at this. I kind of yeah. kind of embarrassed to talk about my ideas, but maybe I just need to get past that. So, and listening to you talk and appreciate it. So thank you. Mm. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm any sort of established expert. I, I, I feel the same way. Um, I, I still feel like a beginner. So <laughs> um, I think yeah, <clears throat> finding people that you can talk to openly about this stuff is great because um, you, you start to take your ideas more seriously and, and, and build off of them. And um, yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, if anybody has any ideas that they, that they want to explore um, more or they're looking for feedback on, I'm happy to go over them with you. Um, <clears throat> I can type my email into the Q&A, maybe into the chat. Um, and you can go ahead and email me if you, um, <clears throat> if you want anybody, if you want help um, workshopping anything um, or just want to throw your ideas out. Um, Michael, I think that your comment about, um, about how you feel about being an artist and feeling, feeling kind of odd putting your questions out there because you're you're new at it um i can tell you that i don't think it matters what level of um experience you have anytime you're putting something out there that is a reflection of yourself or whether that's a, a painting or I mean, for me it was a book I, I think it feels very scary so thank you for asking questions because i felt like they were very relevant so yeah, I think so too. <clears throat> and, I, and I agree, Sunshine. Um, I mean, I think, I think writing is painful. <laughs> you're, you're being really you're personal. You're exploring something that means a lot to you. And you're, you're saying, hey, look at this, that, look at this thing that I spent a, a year developing or however long it is. Um, even if it's an idea that you just had, it's still painful to say, what do you think of this? Give me your honest opinion. Um, but, and, and again, that, I think that's why, you know, honest and truthful collaborators are so important. Um, people you can trust that are, they're not going to tear apart your baby that's at infant form. They're going to help you grow it and develop it by just pointing out some things that maybe you could strengthen. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> um, Let's see, I think I saw a question in the chat. Yeah, the presentation will be available on Facebook. Um, and uh, if you just look up Peonia Film uh, Festival, you can find that. It should be, I think we're uploading them to our YouTube channel as well. Yeah. And that's uh, Paradise of Peonia if you don't have Facebook. Oh, it looks like you already answered that as well. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, any other questions? Does anybody else have any tips for finding a subject, exploring a theme? Yona, <clears throat> anything? <laughs> hey there. Um, I, let me just do my um, video on. Hey, um, I think you said it well, Brennan. I think, um, I mean, I think like, I think a lot of times, I don't know if, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but a lot of times um, I think of, about the things that people want to hear or want to see. And like, you hear a lot of advice for how you should tell stories and, and especially from, you know, very established filmmakers, like, oh, you should do it like this or do it like this. And I think, at the end of the day, it's it's really important to 
to tell the story you want to tell. And then also don't even, you don't even have to really um, adhere to specific, um, you know, what, what the standards are for, for, you know, what a lot of people might think is, is like going to, going to do well or going to get you, you know, whatever job you want or, you know, whatever uh, accolades you want. Um, I don't know. I think that's the, that's like, especially starting out, I think that's like the most important thing is like, just do the stuff you're really excited about. Um, like I, I started, <laughs> I was just watching the stuff I like videos I started making when I was, um, when I was first like starting out in high school. And it was like, it was, it was not, it's not like within a genre or like anything like that, but it was just a lot of fun. And you could tell there's a lot of passion behind it. You know, it's not like they're great. I'm not super proud of them or anything, but they're, uh, they're, you, you can see like, you can see like the beginnings of somebody understanding, okay, this is how framing works and this is how stories, story operates and stuff like that. So I think, I mean, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, you said it, you kind of said it already, but I think just trusting, it takes, it's, it's really hard, but trusting yourself to do, to, to follow through and tell the story, even it's, even if it's, you know, a one minute short or something really, really small, you know, follow through. And then, and, um, and I think there's a lot of doubt that comes up too. Like, I mean, there's a lot of projects right now that I haven't completed because I'm not sure if they're good enough or I, I don't want to share it yet. And I think just forcing ourselves to kind of follow through and, um, and, and, and commit to the story that you are passionate about. Like, even if, <laughs> you know, even if you think maybe a lot of people won't, you know, won't like it or won't resonate with it. Like uh, you will find that when you are finished and you share it, a lot of people end up, or at least in my experience, a lot of people end up like actually really have finding value in what you're saying and stuff. So um, yeah, I don't know, I guess I'm trying to think, I think that's, that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> well, I think those are all really great points. Um, yeah. Like following the excitement that you, that you had either at the, the beginning of the project <clears throat> or reinventing the excitement throughout the process so that you're enjoying what you're doing. Like, like there's a level of um, you trying something new and experimenting. Um, uh, I think all of that stuff's really important. <clears throat> the experimenting part of it is also important, really important, I think, to touch on because it's hard, there's a lot of weight put on, it has to be really good. Um, <clears throat> like, I think we're very um, um, sort of finished project oriented in that we're so focused on making something that people are gonna consume and enjoy that it's hard to sometimes have fun and experiment, but I think it's so important to do that. Um, so for me, when I feel lost, that's sort of where I go back to like, <clears throat> okay, what's exciting about this for me still? Um, like what, what is, what am I, what am I doing with this project that's like personally helping me grow and develop as a person? Um, yeah, wh what, what did I fall in love with this project for? <clears throat> Maybe that's changed now, but what can I re-fall in love with this project for? Um, yeah, I guess I, I might also add that um, <laughs> I think a lot of times, you know, when you're trying to tell a story, it, it what you're like, I think Brennan mentioned this, like the, the, the topics might be changing in real time, especially if you're trying to tell a story about a current event or something. And, um, and I think it's just important to, to kind of really figure out a moment where you can stop and say, okay, this is, this is what I want to say. And it doesn't really matter what happens after this point, I'm just going to tell this story. And then, um, and then at that point, you know, uh, really committing to it. And, and, and it also, a lot of filmmaking is kind of painful. Like you definitely, it's not like a, um, there's definitely moments, a lot of moments throughout each project I've ever worked on where I'm, I hate it. And I'm like, Oh, I don't, <laughs> this is horrible. Like, you know, why am I doing this? But it's, you know, it's just the, like, it's so important to just really go back to the beginning of, okay, why did I want to tell this story? And then kind of find, find it within yourself or, you know, ask for help from others. Um, that's another thing is like really for storytelling, it's so important to ask for feedback and ask for help. And then once, 
you know, that, that often gives you energy to, you know, when you're, when you're in kind of stuck or you're, you're not feeling great about your project, you can kind of go back to the drawing board and ask for advice. And a lot of times that will propel you to, to the point where you can kind of finish something. Yeah. How, how many in general, thank you for all that. That was awesome. Um, how many work of progress? Do you have a lot of stories in progress or do you try to stick with one and do its progression to the end or do you have multiple? <clears throat> That's a good question. <clears throat> for me, I, I have, I think I have two or three right now sort of but I'm, the, the, I'm, I'm working on one as sort of my main thing. And then I have two other ideas that are kind of in the fringes of my mind um, <clears throat> that I like will think about now and then. But for me, it really helps to have one main project because I get obsessive and I start to, to tailor all my resources around that one project. Like the podcasts I'll listen to are about, are gonna be about political polarization right now, because that's what I'm writing about. Um, so it's helpful for me to have that like sort of system developed in my, in my intake of information um, around one subject. But I also think like sometimes one subject can get stale and it's nice to be able to pivot into something else. Um, I know that, um, I forget, you know, the, the name of the director who did Whiplash, um, Oh yeah, Damien Chazelle. Yeah, he uh, he was writing Whiplash, <clears throat> or no, sorry, he was writing um, another movie. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the name. And he ended up pivoting into Whiplash as um, like a side project, and then ended up making that into what it is. Um, but I think that was entirely born out of him sort of feeling frustrated that he wasn't able to crack the story that he was working on. So I, yeah, I, I think it, you know, it totally depends, but when when you are feeling super f stuck, for me personally, I, I'll, I, I will sometimes pivot into another idea or I'll just take everything that I've been working on and, and give it to a, a collaborator or a friend and say, hey, is this total garbage? Like, <laughs> can you help me find what's good about what I'm working on um, here? Um, so I, I do think, you know, when you're feeling stuck, there are things you can do. Um, and I don't necessarily think that banging your head against the wall and, and trying to figure it out is always the best solution.